Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending November 14th. And yes, that is over there. Yeah, I got it. That is the Serenity Firefly spaceship that I've got on my wall there. Decided to make a little bit of a change. First up, this article is from Dave Nicholson. 60 minutes on this bicycle can power your home for 24 hours. Now, this does not. This article is not talking about a conventional Western style home where you need thousands of watts per hour to run the home, but this is a, a type of device that could be used for people in third world countries. And it's a bicycle. I'll put the picture up of the bicycle here. The design, I think, is really good. It's very strongly designed. It's uh, extruded aluminum tubing. They're going to plan on putting 10,000 of these bicycles. Um, they're going to distribute them in India. It's got a flywheel type of design. It's recumbent type of design. Uh, it's got the battery in the back, as you can see, as far as any kind of design for a bicycle to produce limited power in remote areas. I think it's about the best design you could come up with, actually. But I still would like my viewers to kind of pick apart this like I am thinking about it, too, of this would make a better backup plan to something additional, like maybe as your primary source, set up solar panels in a village with some deep cycle batteries or wind generation or a combination of the two and have that be your primary source because then you wouldn't need humans to power it because I'm thinking even with the fact of this flywheel and the, the thing that you could pedal and rest a little bit while you're trying to pedal this thing and even out the energy a little bit more that's still asking a lot from people and especially people that are kind of low on calories because they're poor and not able to f afford good quality food and you know, just the kind of uh, physical shape they would be in. You couldn't always reliably think that there would be enough people in the village to switch off and have somebody every hour pedal it for an hour or even maybe a half hour might be asking too much from people that are calorie deficit in any way. But anyway, this is about, let's see, I'll just read the first part over here. People often complain about the high cost of energy and the fact they never have time to work out. This invention certainly solves both conundrums. I'm still thinking that's not a, a third world problem about working out either. Really, that's more a first world problem. Most importantly, this free power invention has the potential to lift the 1.3 billion people who presently live without electricity out of poverty. As Manoj Bhargava, the founder of the free electric hybrid bike, shares in this video above, it is possible to generate electricity at home without simply, while simply doing a daily workout routine. When an individual pedals the bike, the action drives a flywheel which turns the generator and powers the battery. This means for just one hour of pedaling, a rural household can supply energy for 24 hours. The billionaire and his team developed this bicycle to take advantage of mechanical energy created by humans to solve one of the world's most pervasive problems. Uh, not going to be something that your average person is going to use, but yeah, maybe in rural villages. But like I said, I want you guys to kind of pick it apart, read the article, look at the video, and see. Would you consider this a, a primary system for a remote village in India? Or would you consider this more a backup system if they had something like solar panels or something like uh, uh, wind power turbines, something like that as their primary source? And this next one is another one I want you guys to kind of pick apart too. This was posted on the Dumpster Divers page by Martin J. New scientific study shows how our brains can manipulate the matter around us. It's not really such a new scientific study. You can read through it and it talks a little bit about the random effect generators and computers. But basically what they're getting down to, if you scroll down to the bottom, it's talking about the Global Consciousness Project. And I've been following that for quite a number of years too. I think it was started by a professor in Princeton that started up random number generators and he had the hypothesis that when major world events would happen, major tragedies, major any kind of major event, positive or negative, that would really focus the world's attention, that these random number generators somehow could be pushed to be less random during that time of that event, that somehow the, the global consciousness of all the people and the minds thinking of one particular thing or concentrating on one certain event would have effect on these random generators, and they've got a number of them in different places all around the world. Um, i just like to uh, have you guys kind of pick on that because of the fact, too, to me, that the one thing that concerns me is a lot of people that are into psychic phenomena, a lot of people that are into ghost hunting, things like that, are really grabbing onto this to say, see, this is a connection between psychic abilities and telekinesis and uh, science that is kind of connected up, and I, I still don't see any real, real 
to me elaborate proof. Now the fact is this experiment is a very cheap one to run so if you're not spending much of any money to run it you're basically just running random generators on computers and you could probably even multitask a lot of computers so you wouldn't even really be using you could just use excess computer powers of computers or servers that's running so cost little or nothing but let me just give you a little bit of what Wikipedia says about that. And this is under the section in Wikipedia about claims and debunking of effects from the September 11 terrorist attacks. The GCP, which is the Globalist Consciousness Project, has suggested changes in the level of randomness may have occurred during the September 11th attacks at the time of the plane impacts and the building collapses over the two days following the attacks. Independent scientists Edwin May and James Spottiswood conducted an analysis of the data around the September 11th events and concluded there was no statistically significant change in the randomness of the GCP data during the attacks and the apparent significant deviation reported by Nelson and Radin existed only in their chosen time window. Spikes and fluctuations are to be expected in any random distribution of data and there is no set time frame for how close a spike has to be given for the GCP to say they have found a correlation. So in other words, if you're not really going to be focused on a certain time period, you could say, well, it didn't happen exactly when 9-11 happened. It happened like an hour before, an hour after, five minutes before, five minutes after. I think a lot more needs to be done before I would take this uh, really seriously. But like I said, something worth pursuing just because it's so cheap and there's not really much of any cost to run this experiment. And this next one is from my friend Jose A. This is from Dubai. Dubai Airshow jetpacks finally set for lift off. I don't know if you remember the old style jetpacks that they used to have like in the 60s and 70s that they demonstrated. They were really, really super cool, but they relied on this hydrogen peroxide, really hyped up concentrated fuel. So that gave them a flight time. It gave them a really, really good propulsion force, but a flight time of maybe 30, 45 seconds max. So they were really cool during the short time they did run, but they couldn't run for very long. Well, now evidently the Dubai Defense Civil Defense Force is going to order some of these from... Uh, this guy that's uh, Glenn Martin, I believe is his name. Let me scroll down here. Yeah, Glenn Martin. He invented it, and he's worked on it for 30 years, and it's a ducted fan system using an engine. So these things can run for about 45 minutes. It was invented, the Martin Jetpack was invented by New Zealander Glenn Martin, who had been working on the technology for 30 years. He brought new inventor, inventors and Martin Aircraft listed on the Australian stock market in February. Um, the onboard computer controls a stability system, so if an operator lets go of the controls, the jetpack hovers. And because of the fact we have such good controls, now this is basically you're just talking about a double-ducted fan drone that a person's doing the controlling of it, but they're doing the controlling from within the drone itself. And if drones can fly halfway reliably, you're basically just upsizing the regular old drones that people are playing around with with their cameras and strapping a human on board with enough force to put them up in the air, and they're just controlling the drone from on board the drone rather than um, not. And although some of the people in this article want to kind of promote it as, oh, we're going to have jet packs for your average person, no, they cost about $250,000 a piece. And the only thing they're talking about developing them for right now is for uh, rescue and things like that. So like fire department rescue teams, things like that, that have to get into areas that are difficult to get into. Um, getting up to the top of the building to see if there's people trapped on the top of a building. You could get up there really fast with one of these jet packs. So that's more what they're talking about. And I guess it has been, New Zealand is actually flight certified. It, I looked at the video here and they just show a very, very few seconds in the video of an actual flight of this thing. So I don't have a sense for how much it's actually been flying around and tested. The rest of the part of the video is basically a simulation more than the actual testing and they let people step into one of these uh, simulation type of suits and you put on a, a little headset and then you can actually simulate and fly in one of these things but looks like they may actually have this up and running in the next year or two um, and then last off I'm going to switch locations and talk to you a little bit about the Mars One program it was a private um, corporation that had uh, set up a, a plan to possibly get people to do a one-way trip to Mars and I'll set up about what somebody had to say about that, what one of the finalists had to say about that and how it looks like it's going right now but I'm going to switch to a different location and also give you my opinion and test out of a gadget that somebody brought by for me to, to lent, they brought it by and they lent it to me to check out so catch that just in a minute while I locate on into Studio C Okay, here we are in Studio C, and my friend Aaron 
B has brought by the Easy Go Sunshade. That was one of the two items that I talked about in last week's show, and I think even the week before, he brought this by to demonstrate. And this one supposedly is real easy to set up. I have set it up one time before, and it basically just it springs apart, but the real trick is getting it back together. But meanwhile, I'm going to talk about the Mars One project also. That was a private endeavor to uh, come up with six billion dollars and they had a bunch of people apply. You had to pay 38 bucks to apply and one of the finalists was Dr. Joseph Roche who was an actual astrophysicist. He was going to be one. I think they're going to have something like 10 or a dozen finalists and they were going to fly them um, in for interviews and what they did was they ended up switching it around and having to be 10 minute Skype interviews instead of the flying in interviews and he was getting kind of suspicious that this Mars One project was really going to be real or not and then it ended up the production company, what they were really shooting for was to have a production company, I think it was called Indemol. They were going to come up with a lot of the money to, to put this project and make it a, into a reality TV show with these finalists. Well, they kind of drew out of it and didn't want any part of it anymore, so I think that was kind of the last of the hopes for getting any kind of budget for this Mars One project, but it was a, a $6 billion project, which was kind of low on the budget scale for doing something like that, and it was going to be strictly a one-way trip. They were going to guarantee you passage to Mars if they had enough money to go through with it, but they were not going to guarantee you a return trip back from it. So anyway, I'm going to show you how this thing does, just it kind of springs like that, springs open, and boom, there you go. That's the whole deal. Let me get it turned around here. The real trick is going to be putting it back together. I did actually, the first time, I actually did pretty good putting it back together. Get it set up here. Put it up at an angle here that you can probably see how it works. Now, you probably couldn't sit in a normal sized chair with this. It's about as much as I can spread it apart here. And yeah, normal size chair isn't going to quite work on here. I'll show you. This is my. This is this kind of chair, and it's not quite going to work this way. But if you set on something a little bit smaller, like let me take one of my favorite seats to sit on. Let's say a smaller type of chair, something about, I don't know, about the size of a bucket. How tall is this? About 18 inches, I think, isn't it? I think. What is this? About 15 inches. This is about 15 inches. Set this in there. Yeah, this is not too bad. Now, about a 15 inch shorter chair or something like that. Not more than two people. Either one person and some uh, coolers and camping gear and stuff like that, or maybe bring along less stuff. And two people could fit in here. And it's got the window openings too, so you get some breeze blowing through it. So it's uh, very similar to the umbrella style one that I was talking about. Um, the only place I was still able to find this, I found one used one for around 30 something bucks on Amazon. Somebody was selling, but every place that is selling them brand new, they're either out of stock or back order or something like that. So. Not sure if you'll be able to get a, get a hold of anything like this, but yeah, this is the Easy Go Sunshade. Now let me see if I can actually pack it back up again. Here's the instructions it comes with. They are not very, especially this uh, second part of the instruction is not real clear, so let's see if I can still do this like I did before. You gotta make it kind of like a standing triangle. this okay. then you turn it at a 90 degree angle like this okay I was able to do it again don't even really still know exactly what I did but it just kind of made sense you just kind of Flip it at a 90 degree angle and 
forms into a round bundle like this. There was one tent I was going to buy for traveling that was really good. It was slightly bigger than this. I think it was about another six inches bigger than this. And basically you just let go of it and it just popped together and it was a whole tent. And it was kind of like this to fold up with too. You'd have to kind of fold it into a triangle, give it a little twist, and then put it back together and somehow it did slide back into this round shape. And I thought it was really cool, but being that it was such a large round shape, it would be really hard to carry aboard a motorcycle. So that was the only down part of it is I couldn't find any easy way to get it on the motorcycle. So and then there it goes in the carrying case. And then you just zip it up. I'll zip it up later. But anyway, thank you, Aaron, for bringing that bike for me to, to check out. That was a very interesting uh, piece of uh, gear there for uh, camping out, being on the beach, stuff like that. So that's it for this week, everybody. Take care. I will catch you next week.